Hey, everybody. Welcome to this bonus episode of the Grow Leader Podcast. We're so glad that you're with us today. And as always, before we get started, we want to say a huge thank you to the generous partners who help make the Grow Leader Podcast happen each and every month. The first is the Wesleyan Investment Foundation. For over 80 years, WIF has been helping churches and church planners with their borrowing and investing needs. Maybe you're a pastor or leader dreaming about how you're going to fund a new project or growth opportunity, or you might be at a place where you're trying to decide how to wisely invest and steward your resources. We really think WIF can help you and you can learn more about them at wifonline.com. We also wanna say thank you to Great American Family. Great American Family is America's premier TV destination for high quality family programming. Great American Family is a part of the Great American Media portfolio of brands and is carried through all major cable providers. You can find out more about Great American Family at greatamericanfamily.com. And finally, we want to say a big thank you to Compassion International. Compassion International has been working to serve the world's most vulnerable children in the name of Jesus for over 70 years. And to date, they have helped over 2.2 million children, and that number is going up all the time. And what we love is they reach and serve every single child and family through the power of the local church. To learn more about how you can be a part of what Compassion is doing, visit them at Compassion.com. Well, welcome everyone to the Grow Leader Podcast, where we grow leaders that grow churches by helping them reach their full potential. My name is Matt Miner, and I'm the co-host of this podcast. And with the other side of the co is Pastor Chris Hodges. PC, how you doing? (laughs) I'm doing fantastic, man. We just came out of our annual Impact Conference with the the one and only John Maxwell and just have him in the studio today. And I cannot wait to get to our content and uh, let all of our listeners Glean like I always do when I'm around this this wonderful man. And I was telling John before we got started today that that's what I love about our podcast is that it's 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 a content driven podcast. Right. I, I know more and more podcasts are becoming just uh, conversations that people just feel like they can jump on the couch with. But man, I like taking notes. I like having things that can add value. And that's what grows all about. Of course, is that we are a, a ministry, an organization that is de- that is just man just with all of our heart, want to see churches grow right. to their full potential by investing in their leaders. And of course, John's been part of Grow since day one and is the only guest speaker, really not even a guest speaker, at the Grow Conference every year. And so glad to have him in the studio today. So, John, oh. welcome. <laughs> I'm so delighted to be with the two of you. You know, uh, when you think about your Grow Conference, I, I go every year, but I would go every year if I didn't speak. I told you that. Yeah. Just, just to support the cause because... There is nobody, um, there, nobody, Chris, is helping pastors practically and giving them a game plan. And then not only giving them a game plan, but giving them the security to, that this is something they can accomplish. One of the things I love about you and what you do at Highlands is you take um, great principles and you turn them into very simple practices. And I think when the pastors and the leaders leave grow, they have an empowerment. They're empowered like they never have been before because it's one thing to hear great speeches and messages, but it's another thing to go home and you've got that tool to take with you. Right. And you take it and you can now, you can work it, you can apply it. And what you have done for 17,000 plus churches around the world is absolutely amazing. So I always... Love to be with you and Matt and just enjoy you. And, well, and thank you very much. We were talking earlier, the two of us, about, you know, that I really don't feel like I'm that good at a lot of things, but I, I do know what my kind of my sweet spot is and that as I, I like taking complex things, things that people, other people can't figure out and, and, and making it simple for others to, to do. We just also finished our Impact Conference, which is the event that you and I came up with eight years ago yes. on a golf course. yes to uh, raise money for Highlands College. You told me I'll give you a, a half a day to do leadership uh, to the business community. So it was a completely secular event. I mean, it's in a spiritual environment, but it's, a, it's really a, it's not a spiritual event. It's a, just a secular business yes. a leadership event that for now eight years, we've raised $20 million for Highlands College to God be the glory. And, uh-huh. and, uh, and you come and offer all your time and then you bring in some of your favorite business leaders that you know personally, like we've had Patrick Lencioni, yep. and we've had um, Alan Malawi, yep. and Simon and Simon Sinek, and Dr. Nito Cubane, and then this year had Jamie- uh, Kern Lima. Kern Lima, and my goodness, 
Wow, what a day we had. If you missed <laughs> this event, then you just missed it. You just missed it, yeah. So, and we want to take some of your content from today and just talk about it a little bit. But, John, take a minute and tell our listeners just why you come to this event every year at Highlands College. Well, I come to this event every year because I love what Highlands College is doing. I, I, love, I love your leadership, but I love the, the purpose for the college, and that is to prepare people, prepare leaders to go out and, and, and do ministry. You've said many times, we don't have a harvest problem, we have a worker problem. Yeah, we, we, do. Have, we have a leadership problem. Well, how do you fix that? You fix that by having a college like Highlands that prepares people uh, to go out and do this ministry, but you not only academically prepare them, but they have the opportunity at Highlands to be in an environment of one of the greatest churches in the world. So they get to see things done correctly. Now you have to understand when I was preparing for my ministry, I was went to a really little holiness kind of a Bible college, and uh, their idea of progress was moving backwards slowly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know, I, I I didn't get to I didn't get to see success. Yeah, I, I didn't get to see men and women who really excelled in ministry. And so I never had a picture of the best. You know, we become what we see. And so what I love about Highlands is you have this great academic school, but you say, no, that's not enough. We have to also, we have to prepare them spiritually. We have to, we have to put them in an environment. And how do you develop leaders? You develop leaders by letting them practice leadership. And what I love is like tomorrow I'll be in the chapel and, 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 and speaking because I get to be a you know, professor in residence with you. But here's what I love. The chapels run with the kids. And, and, and how, how, do they, how do they learn how to have a great service? By practicing, by letting them run it. How many times do we do the things for them and then expect them to leave and be able to do it for themselves? So the, 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 um, the environment of, of success with the uh, discipline of the academics, with the uh, practice of what works, all of that's in Highlands College. And, and you, you're just, you're a gift to the, you're a gift to churches all over the world. So uh, that's why I'm here. I'm here. I'm here because I believe in you and I believe in the mission and the ministry. And, and uh, I count it pure joy to have a day like this with you. And we had, oh my gosh, uh, thousands of people that participated right. in today's. I mean, did, did you have what, seven or 8,000 online? Over 8,000 online. Over right? 8,000 plus 28 had, countries. 28 different 20, countries yeah. were watching this. So yeah. I mean, and, and, and this is what's the greatest to the business community. And, and we're getting to you know, be a little bit of salt and light to them. And uh, it, was a it was a great day. Here's what I love. We've done this eight years now, I guess. Every, yep. year, every year it gets better, Chris. Yep. Yep. We're getting better. And, and uh, that's what I love. We're, 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 really, we're really just finding our, our zone. And, 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 and it's, it shows up. It shows up. When, when you come and watch and, and, and participate, it, you could just say, this is good. This yeah. is really good. That's awesome. Well, I want to personally invite all the Grow Leader podcast listeners to next year's event, <laughs> which is the first Wednesday of December. That's usually when we have it. I believe that's December 6th, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. And I'd love for you guys to come be a part of it. And next year we have... Uh, we always, yeah, we always, you always invite one of your friends to introduce to all of, all of us. And next year we have the one and only Doris Kearns Goodwin, who is the probably the world's greatest uh, presidential historian That's uh, in the world. And, and man, her books have so impacted my life. But today I want to talk a little bit in the time just to bless the leaders who weren't there. Sh shame on them for not being here, <laughs> but they weren't. And we'll, uh, get, we'll get them the content anyway through the podcast today. That's who we are. That's, we are. You, that's, that's we are. right. We, we, you talked about second half certainties. Yeah. Just explain the title before we get into the content. Yeah, well, usually, you know, if you have to explain the title, it's probably not a really good title. <laughs> so, so, so let's start. As a communicator, let me now explain the title. Um, <laughs> second half certainties, uh, we think of life as a first half, you know, and then you get in your second half, you have 40, 50, you're in, in second half of the game. And, and the, the thesis basically is that the older we uh, become, the less certainties we have because life just has a way of squeezing the certainties out of us, as you know, guys. I mean, when, when I was young, when I was 25, I had 100 certainties. I just, you know, I was certain about a lot of things. Now I have about a dozen. And, and, but, but what's beautiful is the certainties I have today, I'm more certain of than any other time in life because they've been tested, they've been tried. And, and so I, I did the teaching today. It's gonna become a book. 
But I did the teaching today because I think it's very healthy for somebody that's been down the road to, to, to then mentor people like you, Matt, that you're, you, you know, and say, let me, let me tell you what's ahead. Right. And, and, and let me tell you, you're going to put a lot of effort in a lot of things. But if you do, let me, let me kind of direct your effort to make sure you put them in some of these certainties that are going to really give you a great return in your life. And so uh, we talked about, uh, I th- well, 13 of the certainties today. Give us your favorite. Oh, my gosh. Prop- Probably my... F- the one I would be known for the most would be Everything Rises and Falls on Leadership. I think, I think when I went down my certainty list when I said that, everybody right. said, well, that's John. That's, that, everybody knows that's who I am. That's, that, that's, that's what I know. I think, I think my favorite maybe is intentional living is the best way to maximize mm-hmm. your life. And, and I think it's my favorite because if somebody would ask me, um, they would sit around the table like we are right now, guys, and, and they say, I really, wanna, I really do want to get the best out of what I have. I would say to them, then you better immediately begin to live an intentional life. Don't, don't, don't accept life. Uh, lead life. Be intentional in it. Don't, don't wait for good things to come to you. Become intentional in, in the areas that are going to make a difference. Because intentional living takes good intentions and it turns it into good actions. Right. And, and good intentions, as we know, I mean, we, everybody has good intentions but that has really nothing to do with success at all. I mean, it's, it's kind of like everybody's had an idea when they're in the shower, but it's the person who comes out of the shower and dries off and implements the idea that really gets the return on it. No, nothing happens without action. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so give us yours. Give us what, what you intentionally do every day that you may not feel like doing, but you're just, you've decided, you've pre-decided I am going to do fill in the blank. Well, I'm going to well, I'm going to add value to people. That would be that would be number one. I, I'm just going to intentionally add value to people every day. And, uh, and, and what so, does that look like every day? I mean, is that I know we know we know what you do publicly, but let's say on the day you're not speaking somewhere, how would you how would you add value to somebody on that day? Oh well, well first of all, every time I go into my into my office and, and start writing. I'm not going to be able to speak to them today, but I'm writing words that, is, that they're going to read. So I'm, I'm intentionally adding value to, I'm doing something, I'm taking an action, although I'm not interacting individually with like you today, Matt, I'm taking action on something that's going to add value to you right. tomorrow. So, so when I talk about intentionally adding value to people, there'll be days when I, I honestly wouldn't would hardly see anyone, maybe except Margaret if I'd be at home. But I'm start. I'm still intentionally adding value to people mm. by either my my writing or uh, working on my lessons, or I'm intentionally adding value to people because I have a um, a, a phone list of of, of people that uh, you know. For as you know, I, for example, I have a list of names on my iPhone of people that have expressed that they would like for me to share with them about God. Right. right. And and so I, I take I take that out. Uh, not every day, but I take it out three or four times a week and look at one of the names and, and call them and, and, and intentionally. Here, here, one of the things I love about intentional living is if you're going to live intentionally, you have to think intentionally. And I think this is the, to, to me, the real secret of living intentionally is that I begin to think on the front end. See, you can either think on the front end or you can think on the back end, but here's the difference. If thinking on the front end is 10 to 1 more important than on the back end. How many times have, have we finished something and said, oh, man, I wish I would have done that. And why, why didn't I think of that? Well, you didn't think of it because you didn't think on the front end. Mm. And, and, and so I think, the, I think the secret of success of intentional living is that it causes us to do intentional thinking on the front end. I mean, so that when I get into the podcast with you, and we're talking to all of our listeners and all of our people that watch the podcast, all of our friends, we, we, can, we can really help them. We can really help them because, you know, when you said, this, my podcast is a content podcast. That's why I listen to it. I listen to it because of your content. And by the way, Chris, you do take the complicated and make it simple. Yeah. But, but, but you do it one more. There are some people who can take complicated and make it simple, but then you take the simple and make it Appliable to a person's life. They, they, could, they, they not only now, to, to take complicated and go simple means I understand it. To take simple and take it to application means I do it. And so you have two steps, I think, and I think that's your secret sauce. Mm. If somebody said, what, what's Chris Hodges do 
better than anybody I know, I would tell them he takes complicated, makes it simple, then he makes takes simple and makes it applyable to a person's life. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. And then one of the things that you did for me, because you've been mentoring me for almost 20 years now. and um, Beautiful 20 years. Well, it has been, and honestly, and I, I can't say thank you enough I'm a, and tell you how much I love you. Yeah, and I, I just, love you too. I deeply love you. Um, Precious friend. But but one of the greatest gifts you gave me uh, is is being able to think it on the front end and even write it out. Like what? And one of my favorite teachings that you have is, is that rule of five. Oh, yeah. Of course, my favorite book of yours is Today Matters. I've said that for 20 yeah. years. It's just because it makes it helps you make every day a masterpiece. And when my days that were intentional, that weren't really producing much, um, you, you, I can get a little discouraging when you know you're doing the right thing and you're intentional about doing the right thing, but you didn't see a whole lot of fruit from it. But now I'm kind of 40 years into the oh. process now, oh. <laughs> and you have that compounding effect of doing those that rule of five every day. And that's what you helped me with. You helped me make a day a masterpiece, but not have the expectation of it being what I was hoping on that day. Let it compound over years. Unpack that. Oh, honestly, I, if there's I would this, love if, to unpack that. I'm so. If you, if you, uh, seriously, if people say, "What's the greatest thing John taught you?" He, he, you taught me how to be intentional by making every day intentional and a masterpiece. But I mean, I have my rule of five. I have the things that I do. Of course you do. And 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 I think it's just it's, it's just now paying off. Honestly, I'm so, well, I'm so glad you really brought that up. Honestly, Chris, because I, I think you talk about secret sauce. First of all, John Wooden mentored me and had a great impact on my life. And he's the one that said, you know, when opportunity comes, it's too late to prepare. And his whole thing was, and, and what is that? That's thinking and acting ahead of the opportunity. Right. It, it's getting right. In fact, I asked him one time, uh, you know, of course, he was such a successful coach at UCLA. And I asked him, I said, what do you miss it most about coaching? Oh, he said, practice, the practice sessions. I said, okay, pull that out for me. Oh, he said, John, he said, in the practice sessions, we could do the basic things and practice the basic things that would help us win when we played the game. And he told me something very interesting. He said, so I was challenged with the practice session because I knew if we practice well, as you practice is how you play. He said, by the time the game came, and if, if you got to be old, but if, you, if you're old like I am, John Wooden, who was this incredible coach, would literally sit on the bench and he would, and he would cross, he'd cross his leg and he'd hold a, 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 a program yeah. in his hand and, and he basically watched his team play like this. <laughs> I mean, almost like a, a, a spectator. A spectator that, <laughs> that really came to the game, but they really don't care how, what happens. It's, it's just like, you know, I'll watch the game. And he told me, he said, the game was already a foregone conclusion. He, and, and, the, and so it was from him. Now, let's go, because this, this is, I think, huge for your podcast players. He taught me that it has to, work has to be stored up before it shows up. Oh, wow. And if you don't store it up, when it comes time to show, you have no show and tell at all. And so he, he taught me, he said, and that's where the compounding comes. In the beginning of whatever we do in life, we're doing a lot of good things, and, and but it doesn't show up. And you just say, well, I don't know, should I keep doing this? And, and sometimes because it doesn't show up, we quit. But he said, no, you just stay with it. And it's stored up, stored up. And then one day, it starts showing up. And then it begins to show up. And people say, wow, how did they know this? And look what they're doing. It was my father who said, he had another way of saying it. And he taught me when I was 17. I said I was going to go in the ministry. And, and he said, well, then, John, you never have an empty well. Mm. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, you got to fill the well. you got you got to be able to go over and take. He said, you got to have a full well so you can take your bucket when you need it and go and get, get, that, right. get that water. Well, you, you do an awful lot of storing up before you get the privilege of even putting the bucket in the water to take it to show up. And I think, I think the miss is that so for so many of us, if it doesn't show up, we, we get discouraged and we say, well, and, 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 and what's sad is about the time the compounding is, is about to give you the return. About the time the well is full enough for you to begin to pull water out of it, is sometimes we, we just, we almost, sometimes we quit right before we were about to have the abundant harvest. And, and you know, like I say, when you can afford to quit, you can't afford to quit. And, yeah, that was Jamie's story today. It was amazing. Oh, wasn't that great? Yeah, I don't know if our listeners know who she is, but Jamie Kern Lima, who... Um, uh, created this cosmetic brand 
had hundreds and hundreds of no's as she was trying to create this business out of her home. So many times she could have just given quit. up on her dream and quit. And of course, ultimately ends up selling her, her business to L'Oreal for $1.2 billion. Yeah, that with works a, out, it works out. That's with, a B. With a B. That's right. a B. In case, in case you thought you didn't hear, right? It's and then a B. became the first um, female CEO of L'Oreal. And just, and just, but how inspiring... Uh, it was, you know, to hang in there. It was just fantastic. We, we, we're going to get to our listeners uh, some of this content, especially the, the 13 things that John taught about uh, these second half certainties. John, the one on, on, your, on the list that I, I don't think, I've, knew, I've known you more uh, longer than everybody else in that room. And I know it's a value, but it honestly surprised me when it was on the list because this is the first time I've heard this talk of this second yes. half certainties, and it's the fourth one, and that is everybody needs forgiveness, so forgive. Yeah. I, I, it was a beautiful moment, yeah. my friend. Yeah, it was, yeah. And I know, I know you, after you said it, I, I know, well, I know why he said that, because of the way our culture is right now. It is so, you're one and done. They'll write you off so fast, and people are carrying so many grudges and bitternesses and canceling and, Unpack this one for a little while. I think it would bless our listeners just to hear your thoughts on this one. Well, first of all, it's just not fair. It's not the, the social media is not fair. Every one of us have done stuff that social media could blow up on negatively. I mean, there's no, not no person. I mean, let me just start here. Haven't we all said something stupid? I mean, I'm 75 and I still say stupid things. I mean, and, and to to not be able to have uh, grace and forgiveness and a little bit of room for humanity and, and, a, and, and a willingness to, to say, well, yeah, that was a little stupid thing John said, but, but, but I say stupid. You know, it, it's kind of like when I'm, when I'm not unforgiving to you, it's almost like I'm perfect. And so I, I feel, in fact, you could tell in the room when I started this, and I, I really, because I didn't have a time to do it, I didn't really get to unpack it correctly or probably like I would have liked to. But it, what, I, what I ask people is very simple. Has there ever been a time in your life where you really needed somebody to forgive you? And have you ever felt that perhaps they didn't forgive you? And, and how did that make you? Because I, I've had a couple times in my life where I asked forgiveness and um, I wasn't forgiven. And I felt clear in my heart mm. because I truly meant I wanted to be forgiven. So I, I, you know what? When you have done everything possible, but the person on the other side doesn't release you from it, it hangs with you. It hangs with you, and you, you kind of kind of want to redouble back and say, "Well, I wonder what else I could do, or, uh, or maybe maybe I need to maybe I didn't explain myself right. Maybe maybe I need to go back again." And and you carry you carry unnecessary weight with you. I can also think I, I I remember a time David Jeremiah was a very close friend of me when I lived in San Diego, and he he preached a wonderful message one time of which I took notes on. It was a great message. He's a great he's a great communicator. And probably a couple years later, I wrote a book, and, and I had taken a message, but I had carelessly, wrongly, not put down where I got it. And I put it in my book. I put it in my book. And I'll never forget, uh, we had, we'd, we'd have monthly lunch just because we had good friendship. And he brought the book one day. And, and honestly, I thought, oh, he brought my book, and he want me to sign it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and he brought the book, and he said, John, he said, do you mind if we could, we could, this might be a little bit of a hard conversation. And then he told me, and immediately when he told me that I had put in something, that I didn't give him any credit. I wasn't trying. I, I just had right. humanly forgot. I didn't give him any credit and said, I got this from David, the whole process. And I, I felt terrible. I remember how bad I felt. And I said, David, how can I? I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And I, 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 what was so beautiful? Is it, he looked at me and he smiled and he said, I know that you didn't do this intentionally and you're totally forgiven and we'll never talk about it again. And I remember how I, mm. how I just felt a whole weight come off oh. of me. And, and that drew me even closer in my friendship to him sure. because he was so kind to me and he was so ready to say you're forgiven. And so I, when I say everybody needs forgiveness to so forgive everybody, I need forgiveness. There are times, I mean, and, and, and I'm, what a fool I am to think even at 75, 
that I'm not going to have to go back. To, you know, maybe it's to Margaret, my wife. I mean, hello. Mm. But and, and look at somebody say, you know what? I was wrong there. I missed that. Right. Would you forgive me? And the moment I taught that certainty today, you could feel in the room, everybody in that room either needed to forgive somebody they hadn't forgiven or they needed somebody to give them forgiveness. Right. It's just, it's, um, oh, I forget the writer. He was so famous. Um, shoot. But he wrote at the capital city. Oh, uh, Ernest Hemingway. Yeah. And he tells about Paco, who in his, in his, a son of a fa- and the father had a, a bad relationship, and the son went home, and they lived in Madrid, and the father couldn't handle the fact that, you know, he that that he and his son were strained in the relationship, and so he put in the newspaper, uh, Paco, meet me uh, tomorrow at noon at the fountain at the square. All is forgiven. Love, Dad. And the next day, when he went to the square. There were 700 Pacos that showed up. Oh wow! And I thought, isn't that the way it is? We're all we're all we're we're either we either need to be on the I'm forgiving you side, or I need to be forgiven. That was actually one of the uh, powerful moments too in Jamie's story, as she talks about one of the. Um, yes. business executives that she pitched to that she had great respect for. She had actually thought she had closed the deal. She was right up to the moment. And they said, we love your product, but the answer is no. Yep. And she said, can you tell me why? And he goes, well, if you really want to know the truth, I mean, you're asking for it. But if you want to know the truth is uh, you don't have the right body figure yep. and you don't look you don't look the part to be a, a beauty executive or a, a, the owner of a, a, of a cosmetic company. You know, I don't think the clientele is going to receive from somebody who looks like you. And I was expecting her to have a little bit more different uh, side of this story, how, you know, she had to work through bitterness and anger and forgive over. And I think what makes her such a remarkable leader was she immediately did not let that land in her heart. Yeah, that's she, right. She just, she, 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 you know, she talked about um, she still she had that knowing on the inside of what she was called to do, and and we even talked about it at lunch afterwards. How she has this ability to not let it land. I think one of the problems with a lot of the leaders today, John, and the reason why they don't lead so well is they're letting too many things land. I do too. And it's a louder voice than the knower on the inside. So they've allowed the outside voice, even voices they've never met before, define who they are help them think who they are, and they're not letting the thing they know by their own creator define who they are. So they're letting this other voice, this outside voice, dominate that calling, that surety that is in their spirit. And I said this in in our Q&A session, that if I could wave the magic wand and give leaders one quality, it would be that security, that, that certainty of their lane, their assignment, their calling. I call it my portion. I know my portion. I don't covet anybody else's portion. So when somebody criticizes me, that's fine with me. I know what I'm here to do. Speak to that a little bit, because I thought that was yeah. a powerful part of our day. Well, first of all, when we did the Q&A, I loved, I loved, I, I loved your phrase, my portion. I had not heard that. And, and it, but you put it in the context, I have a portion of gifts and the calling that God has given me. And, uh, you know, I, I said one time, it was a great day in my life when I realized that my calling wasn't subject to a conference call. Hmm. You know, I, I, I don't need the rest of you on the call to kind of validate what God has already told me. God has told me in that whole process. But when she gave that illustration today, I thought she had hundreds of no's. Over a period of about eight years. Yeah. Just no, no, no. Hundreds, hundreds of no's. Now, here, here's the part. So let's talk about your example. The guy says, you don't have the right body fit for this. If she takes that and lets that land personally in her spirit, which creates all kind of bitterness and anger and all, all, all kind of negative emotions, here, here's what I say. There are enough no's in life that we cannot control that cause weight to come into our life. What we don't want to do is add weight to our life that we can't control. Right. And, and, and if she would have begun to take those things personally and, and that rejection personally, it would have weighted her down. She would, have, she would have never had the strength to get to the end because she was in an endurance marathon. She, it was, she wasn't doing a 100-yard sprint and, and 12 seconds later, we, we all can go have something to eat. She's in a marathon. If she doesn't take, if she takes those rejections and those 
negative thoughts to her. If she takes it personally, she's not going to have enough weight. She's already going to have a lot of no weight on her. And we can't afford to put more. And so here's what I say. Carry, carry, only carry the weight. Don't, don't add to your own personal weight. Mm. Only carry the weight that you have to carry as a leader because you are out in front and you do get those blows and you do get those hits. That makes sense? Absolutely. So, but don't add, don't add to that weight. And what I loved about her is she had that ability not to let it land, forgive, move on, and, and, and not let it control what she did next. Yep. Well, Good. she even asked a question, which I think is a great just evaluation point for any leader. Study how you respond when you're rejected. Yeah. When yeah. somebody rejects you, study how you respond. That was good, to Matt. And if you'll dive into that, that'll make you a better leader. Because if every time it's, I can't stand them, I'm writing them off, yeah. I won't talk to them anymore, it affects the way we lead people. I'm thinking about this a lot right now because of the lunch you and I had uh, just yesterday with Dr. Sam Chan. Yes. And he, was, he told us that according to the Pew Research, Hartford Institute, Lifeway Research, that over the next six years, um, if there are 300,000 churches in America, 100,000 of them, one-third of all churches are going to lose their primary leader, either through just quitting, retiring. So while we're over here at Highlands College trying to supply the, <laughs> the Great Commission with leaders of competence and character, we're actually having, a, having hundreds of thousands of— A deficit. It's, we're in a deficit. Um, and it's, a, it's very, very concerning, and a lot of it's for some of these reasons that we're talking about. And one of my favorite— um, uh, points that you made, it was, it was number eight of your 13 certainties was that your perspective becomes your world. And I think people have lost perspective today. I, I think they've completely lost perspective of their calling, of culture. Help us with that. You're, you're the best in the world at perspective. Help, help, that's a powerful one. Your perspective becomes your world. Well, I, I, I think it's a fact. Uh, that's why two people can be side by side and live in two totally different worlds. Because what you see is what you get. And so what I see is it becomes my work. And it becomes reality to me. And one of the things I learned a long time ago is the fact that we have the ability to choose our perspective. So when, when, when you live in the wrong world, it's because you made the wrong perspective choice. You, you determined to have scarcity instead of abundance. You, you, hey, you determined not to be forgiving and, and keep score versus travel light. And, 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 and turn the other cheek and walk the... And so, so whatever our perspective is, that puts us in the world that we have. And so when people come to me and they tell me the fact, well, you know, there just aren't very many opportunities today. I mean, I look at them and I, I, I say, you're right. <laughs> you're exactly right. As long as you live in that world, there, there, are, there are not very many opportunities to you. you ha so if, how do you change? You change your life by changing your perspective. So good. So, so when somebody says, I want to change my life, the first thing I know they need to do is that they're thinking wrong. And the greatest gap between successful and unsuccessful people is their perspective. That's the greatest gap. It, and, and we all live in the same world, but we don't have the same world that we live in. And that's a, that's a perspective issue. We're out of time. Let's go on. I wish we could keep going. <laughs> I, Man. I looked over at the clock and it said all zeros. And I went, well, no way. It's when, it's, when it's in red, you know you're in trouble. Yeah. Huh? You've been fighting the clock all day today. We, yeah, we I, 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 well, all day today. you know Chris. He's, <laughs> I, I mean, that's just who Chris Hodges is. He, 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 he's got that clock and I'm looking at it. Like, what the? Get that clock out of It's called way. order, people. You do <laughs> things with excellence and in order. And you do. <laughs> and, and nobody does it better than you. You taught him how to live intentionally, and he does it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything's yeah, on purpose that's right here. So, hey, we're so grateful for you. Thank Thanks, you for man. the time you give to us. My joy. Uh, several times a year. And uh, we, we are excited about the next time you're going to be with us. And I know you're investing into a whole lot of pastors today. So thank you very, very much. We'll see you next time on the Grow Leader Podcast.